In the earliest days of cinema, films were advertised by way of posters, sandwich men with billboards, and newspaper ads. This poster is the very first film poster, advertising La Roseur à Rosé, made by the Lumière brothers in 1895. Outside of its historical significance, the advertisement alerts audiences to the film as much as it does to the act of film going. Initially, the first advertisements shown in theatres were not for films at all, but rather for whiskey and cigarettes. Back in those early days, the films lasted only about 10 minutes, or one reel, and the turnover in programming was far too fast for anyone to even think about advertising coming attractions. The first trailer dates from 1912, and a serial adventure called What Happened to Mary. The series was already eight episodes old, when suddenly audiences saw a single caption that trailed the film. This is where the term trailer comes from. Because the films back then were what we now refer to as silent, the films could only use title cards to carry the plot. But since we now have sound, trailers have more ways of telling you what the film is about. I am privileged to say a few words to you in this most modern and novel manner. Privileged because it's the first living Vitaphone announcement ever made announcing the coming of one of the year's outstanding pictures. What is the picture? Oh, well, of course. You guessed that I'm referring to Warner Brothers' supreme triumph, Al Jolson in The Jazz Singer. History has afforded The Jazz Singer the status of Hollywood's first talking motion picture. And as if anticipating its importance, Warner Brothers created a trailer to inform audiences of the seismic event. From here, the narrator became an important tool in the delivery of the coming attractions. Gone with the Wind has captured the imagination and acclaim of the entire world. The screen has never known a love story to compare with this, when Rhett Butler meets Scarlett O'Hara. I love you more than I've ever loved any woman. And I've waited longer for you than I've ever waited for any woman. Scarlett, kiss me. Such trailers were produced by the National Screen Service. It was founded in 1920, at a time when the studios had curiously not yet adapted their advertising materials to trailers. Their forte was still print advertising. The National Screen Service secured not only a monopoly with the studios, it enjoyed that monopoly for over four decades. From the days of silent cinema on into the sound era and right through to the 1960s, the National Screen Service was the sole creator and distributor of movie trailers. As a result, their trailers were very generic, and it was very rare that an ad campaign broke with that orthodoxy. One of the first trailers to step away from that stale style was for a low-budget black-and-white movie made in 1960. Good afternoon. Here we have a quiet little motel tucked away off the main highway and as you see, perfectly harmless looking. When in fact, it has now become known as the scene of the crime. At this point, we need to take into account the manner in which we receive film. Back in the time of Lumière and Méliès, audiences sat in improvised spaces, cafes, halls, tents, and watched the images as they flickered across the screen. Then came the Nickelodeons, the first purpose-built arenas specifically for viewing films. After that, the more prestigious venues became bigger. Manhattan's Radio City Music Hall, for instance, can house nearly 6,000 patrons. By the 1950s, things got smaller with the arrival of television, because by then, audiences had an option to stay home for their evening's entertainment. The arrival of television had an enormous impact on the movie trailer. In fact, it heralded the arrival of arguably the most influential Hollywood director of the last 50 years, Andrew Keane. Keane was influential because he directed movie trailers, thousands of them. And perhaps more than any other director, Keane shaped the way Hollywood advertised its product.
something beyond comprehension is happening to a little girl on this street, in this house. A man has been sent for as a last resort to try and save her. There is a creature alive today who has survived millions of years of evolution without change, without passion, and without logic. It lives to kill. A mindless eating machine. It will attack and devour anything. It is as if God created the devil and gave him jaws. <laughs> just as television advertising took off and he instantly recognised that film was going to be affected by the pace of the new medium. He knew that trailers would have to be short, sharp and innovative. Groundbreaking as Keane's work was, it was another film released the same year as The Night of the Iguana that proved to be two decades ahead of its time. <laughs> Conceived by Stanley Kubrick and Pablo Ferro, the trailer uses 220 shots in 97 seconds to sell a comedy about nuclear inhalation. Such rapid cubist cutting would not become the norm until the arrival of MTV, which in itself helped usher in a different aesthetic. <laughs> Sharp edits, cut to pop songs became the way in which films were advertised to young audiences. What is it with you? Just want to serve my country, be the best fighter pilot in Navy, sir. The National Screen Service trailers were designed to do one thing, get the audience into the theatre. But amid the social and cultural shifts of the 1960s, it was Andrew Keane who realised that the audience was fragmenting and he knew that an effective trailer kept people out of the theatre as much as it did getting them in. You would not want patrons mistaking this picture for this one. Sometimes reality is the strangest fantasy of all. The films of Michelangelo Antonioni speak every language. This is his first in English. What's your name? Using a particular typeface on captions, identifying the star and deploying particular music all carefully positions the film for the audience. More than anyone else, it was Andrew Keane who reshaped and refined all those techniques. He knew that with the right music you could conjure a whole host of moods. From comedy to horror and action to romance, the right chord with the right instrument could trigger the right emotion. You're listening to Randy Edelman's award-winning score for Alan Parker's World War II romantic drama, Come See the Paradise. Edelman's melody proved so popular with trailer makers 
that he licensed it out to no less than 27 ad campaigns. In fact, between theatrical trailers and TV spots, Edelman earned more money from licensing that one tune that Parker's film earned in its entire theatrical run. <laughs> This music has been used in over 20 trailers. And so has this. And they both hail from a company called Immediate Music. And when it comes to composing and then licensing the music to the studios, Immediate Music are to today's trailers what the National Screen Service was to trailers in the 1950s. Their tunes may be generic, but that's part of their success. If trailers are about one thing, it is familiarity. You have two and a half minutes to tell a story that audiences will be comfortable with. And that familiarity comes from repetition. Or, to use another word, cliché. In a world where laughter was king. Uh, no in a world, Jack. What do you mean, no in a world? Odd as it may sound, when voiceover artists such as Don LaFontaine first used such lines of copy, it was considered cutting edge. Now it seems that a new phase in the trailer has dispensed with the voiceover artist and is using only dialogue from the film. Trailers are about two and a half minutes long, and the trailer for The Social Network was daring because it spent an entire minute showing us nothing from the movie itself. Instead, it played images from a pastime several hundred million people partake in, updating their Facebook page. And maybe that's where the innovative trailers are going now. They don't tell you the plot, but they sell you the context. Despite the amount of money that Hollywood studios pump into marketing their films, independent research repeatedly shows that what draws an audience into a film is not advertising, but word of mouth. Where once upon a time an unknowing public would flock to a film because cinema was literally the only show in town, Hollywood has to contend now with other forms of mass entertainment. Back in the 1930s, almost 90% of every entertainment dollar went into the studio's coffers. Currently, with television, pop music, computer games, the internet and other recreational activities, Hollywood is facing an uphill battle in even maintaining its much reduced percentage. In 2013, Hollywood's box office take was $10.8 billion, while the equivalent number for the games industry was $93 billion. It appears then that the way forward for Hollywood publicity is through the internet. Your best friend is suing you for $600 million. As for the charges, I believe I deserve some recognition from this board. I I'm sorry? Yes. I don't understand. Which part? Given Andrew Keane's response to television, one could only imagine where he could have taken the movie trailer with the arrival of the internet. The two media collided in late 1998 when the trailer for Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace, was attached onto screenings for Meet Joe Black. So eager were some moviegoers to catch a first glimpse of the latest instalment of the sci-fi saga, they paid full ticket prices for the main feature, waited for the highly anticipated trailer, and then skipped out the door. Other fans managed to smuggle camcorders into theatres and record the teaser, before uploading it onto the internet. Initially, Lucasfilm claimed copyright violation, but they soon posted the trailer on the official Star Wars website, and such was the fevered interest that their ISP quickly jammed. Studios took notice of the internet's power to take their trailers to the masses, and from that point on, trailers became the property of PC monitors as well as multiplexes. Phil, can you tell a little more about what you might want for your birthday? Can I get a puppy? You want to get a dog? Yeah, a cuddly fluffy one. And a Bratz movie star makeover, Sasha. <laughs> I'm just fucking with you, Daddy. I love a bench fit model 42 butterfly knife. Oh, child. <laughs> you always knock me for a loop. When screening a trailer in a theatre, exhibitors must ensure that the trailer is suitable for the audience who are attending the main feature. It's a little kid. Evidently, then, 
trailer content has been considerably restricted. However, the arrival of the internet has brought with it the red band trailer. Such trailers have become their own subgenre, regularly using violence, nudity and profanity to sell moviegoers on the notion that they'll see risque entertainment. And this brings us back to word of mouth. Irrespective of whether it is a regular trailer or an age-restricted red band teaser, fans of an upcoming film will upload the trailers onto their own blogs and Facebook profiles and post them outside of YouTube's age gates. In the earliest days of cinema, films were advertised by way of posters, sandwich memo billboards and newspaper ads. And in those days, almost every film was subject to bootlegging. Within days of a film being exhibited, other filmmakers were busily making their own versions. Today, with editing applications being available for home use, and with digital piracy making films available before they are even released into theatres, someone, somewhere, is already cutting their own version of this movie. Oh, what a day! What a lovely day! <laughs> What's your name? 